down. Does this? Wow. So anyway, what I'd like to talk to you all about is... Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm not going to do that again. Have you all had a good day? Had a good day? Um, I tell you what, I, two, two observations. You, you've had some great folks to, um, to just talk out of their experience and, uh, and their knowledge base. And I sat in on Brent Harriman's seminar this morning about soul care. Uh, I got to hear about the first half of it. But uh, uh, I, I, I hope you're getting just tons of benefit. And it, it may, you may feel uh, saturated at this point. I'll try not to go on and on tonight. But, uh, but I, I, just, I hope you're drinking it up and taking lots of notes so that you can process it later. Uh, I, but let me say this too, and I, I may even mention this in a seminar that I'm going to do, but one of the closest approximations I've ever had to, to this kind of training time together is when I was in RUF. And um, we would get together twice a year for staff training. It would be all the campus ministers in the United States. And uh, we'd get together once in the summer and then once... Uh, a couple of weeks before Christmas, and I remember, and Dana could my, could vouch for this, that I simultaneously loved it and I hated it. I loved it because of what I just said. Just it was just rich time, the instruction, <clears throat> the the collegiality, the you know, not only the information we were getting, but just the, the 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 guys that I was getting to bat stuff around with, and just friends from seminary, just loved them. I hated it because it made all my insecurities just flare. Because, you know, you'd look around the, the room with all these campus ministers and you'd think, um, like, that guy. That guy is so gifted in small groups. And most campus ministers are bad at small groups. You know, they're like preacher guys and they like to talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, but they're bad at small groups because other people talk in the small groups. <laughs> the nerve. And... So they, they would struggle with that, and, uh, but, but like this guy's great at it, all his small groups go well, and they're life changing, and like this guy's great at evangelism, and he leads people to Christ, and this guy's really a great teacher. This guy has got it going on theologically, we had guys that went on and got PhDs, or had PhDs. Um, this guy's really culturally engaged, he, I just, he's always kind of ahead of the curve on music, books, movies, whatever. And, uh, and then the worst was like, and this guy really loves people. And all of us hated him. <laughs> but, I, I, you know, I just, uh, all that to say, I don't know what a time like this does to you in, in your insides, but, because I know there's, just as you're listening to other people, as you're hearing people raise questions, or you're getting in conversations, um, I don't know if it does that to you or not, but I, I just my exhortation to you would be, just, just, and this is easier said than done, but just be yourself, you know. Uh, don't try to compete or come across in a way that you're not. I, I, I would soak up every good thing you can. I would, <clears throat> I would have every good conversation I could have. But just, uh, I think one way of showing that you believe in justification by faith is just uh, be yourself and, um, and try and enjoy it. And that sounds sort of humdrum, but I think it's, I don't know, easier said than done. But I hope you will. Well, we are going to be looking in the book of Exodus tonight, and we're looking at the veil and the lampstand. The veil and the lampstand, and we're going to start off, well, the texts are there, but in case uh, you want to have your Bible open to, it's Exodus 26, starting off in the latter part of Exodus 26. You know, along with C.S. Lewis's books, the Chronicles of Narnia and the Space Trilogy, and Mere Christianity and Great Divorce, some of the theological books. He cranked out a lot of essays, and uh, you, you may have one or several of these collections of essays. One collection I have, the first essay in this collection is called The Necessity of Chivalry. And you may or may not know this, but C.S. Lewis's day job was not writing Christian books. Uh, it was not being a theologian. His day job was being uh, an English professor, and his area of expertise was medi medieval li literature and Renaissance literature. Uh, so he knew just lots and lots and lots about knights and just the culture of the medieval period, about chivalry, knighthood, all that. It's a short essay, but he, he starts out with this great point. He said that a knight, K-N-I-G-H-T, a knight was somebody that, that lived with this huge both-and in his life, because on the one hand he was 
capable of extreme violence. A night with somebody that after a pretty short time he was accustomed to the sight of lopped off arms, you know, or smashed faces. And a couple of summers ago, I, I reread, I hadn't read it in the longest time, I read the, the, the Arthurian legend. There's just people just constantly bashing each other's faces in, lopping arms off. Um, so he's accustomed to that sight. And, not but, and he's just almost maiden-like in his manners. Very gentle. And he knows how to do the both ends. So when it's time to be fierce, he's fierce. And he's fierce to the peg. He's fierce, like Lewis says, he's fierce to the nth degree. And, but when, he, when he's at a banquet or when he's in the presence of a lady or in certain settings, he's gentle. Not just somewhat gentle. He's gentle to the nth degree. Uh, our minds struggle with that, I think. I, I think our minds struggle with both and. Or maybe it's just me. I, I like things typically to be either or. And a lot about life pushes you toward both and. And what I want, what I want to look at is in, in all kinds of places in the tabernacle, but the veil and the lampstand, both of them push on both and realities about God. And let me, let me throw out a couple of, couple of jargony words before we read the text. Transcendence and eminence. And neither of those words appear in Scripture, but they get at things that are all through the Scripture. Transcendence, the bigness of God, the otherness of God. He's the creator. We're the creature. Uh, he is not on the hook. If anybody's on the hook, we're on the hook. We're finite. He's infinite, transcendent. Eminence is he is kind. He is near. He is relational. He initiates. He is love. Which is it? Both. Both and. I want to look at how some of those realities come through in these items of the tabernacle. Let's start off in Exodus chapter 26, beginning in verse 31, looking at the veil. And you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. It shall be made with cherubim, skillfully worked into it. And you shall hang it on four pillars of acacia overlaid with gold, with hooks of gold on four bases of silver. And you shall hang the veil from the clasps and bring the ark of the testimony in there within the veil. And the veil shall separate for you the holy place from the most holy. Amen. Let's pray together. Father God, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, almost five years ago, I won a trip to Europe literally by putting my name and email on a online registration thing. I, wa I won a trip to Europe. I, I'm sorry. I did. <laughs> and it was uh, 2009. <clears throat> it was the, the celebration of the 500th it was the 500th uh, um, year of, of Calvin's birth. He was born in 1509. And um, for, if you couldn't have done that math just then, he was born in 1509, so 2009. And it was in France, but mostly Geneva. And just one day I saw this thing, like a little online banner pop up and say, hey, register to win a free trip to the Calvin 500 celebrations. Put my name, put my email, doop, and won. <laughs> so... Got to go, and it was amazing. And uh, I had never been to France. Got to go to France. I had never been to Geneva. Got to go to Geneva. The last day I was there, I was coming out of Calvin's uh, church, the St. Saint, Pierre Cathedral, and walked out. Of course, you've got all these big public areas around it, and um, just coming off a big worship time and just lots of hymnody and lots of preaching and teaching and all that. And I walked out, and there's this uh, woman sitting about 20 yards from the entrance to the cathedral and she's just sitting on a curb and she's just weeping. 
and uh, and she was kind of in my path, so I saw her, and I, you know, that tension of, I feel like I need to say something, but I don't know her, and I don't know the circumstances, and, and so I finally just went over to her and didn't know what to say. I just said, hey, I, I'm concerned about you. Are you okay? And, um, and she kind of sniffed and, and nodded, and I said, well, can I sit down beside you? And she said, yeah, and so I sat down, and and I asked her her name, and it was uh, Bahia. And she looked uh, Middle Eastern, don't know what country. And, um, and we began talking. I said, well, you look so upset. I, t t tell me what's going on. And she said, well, uh, well tell me about you. What, what, what do you do? And I said, well, I, actually, I'm a preacher. I said, what do you do? And, and she kind of went, <laughs> she said, I'm a shrink. Uh, she was a therapist. She was a psychologist, and uh, and we talked about what was going on in her life and prayed with her. But but the way she responded when she kind of went, I'm a shrink. It was just I think she was acknowledging the irony of I talk to people who are weeping and help them, but I'm sitting here weeping because of what's going on in my life. And man, I I, I now I've never been a therapist, but I have categories for that. I'm a pastor, and uh, I counsel people. But as you counsel people, what you quickly become aware of, and you're doing this with youth all the time, you become quickly aware that we all have blind spots. And the more you talk to people about their, their blind spots, what does it make you wonder about yourself? <laughs> oh dear, what are my blind spots? Um, I'm a pastor and I do marriage counseling. And this afternoon, coming up on 20 years of marriage, this summer... Dana and I will have been married 20 years. For the very first time, we sat down with a therapist for a couple of hours and got marriage counseling. And um, man, you know, you think you're so objective about yourself. And we're not so dang smart <laughs> about ourselves. You know, you'd think the easiest person to be objective about would be yourself. And it is the hardest thing to be objective about oneself. Well, I, I, want you, I, I don't want you to hang on to that as, as we're going to this because, again, these items in the tabernacle, they're not just saying things about who God is. They're saying things about who we are. Now, first and foremost, they're telling us things about God, but they are also telling us things about ourselves, things that left to ourselves we would not figure out about ourselves. And again, what I want to hang on to is, as they do so, they are big, block, you know, blinking bright red flashing arrows pointing ahead to the person and work of Jesus Christ. So let's look at these two items, the veil and then the lampstand. First off, the veil. Now, just so we're on the same page, you know, the, the, the tabernacles, if you're looking at it, an aerial view, it's a big rectangle. And when you walk in, we looked at last night, the first thing you would encounter is what? The altar of burnt offering, that's right. And then going past that, you'd make your way to a space that's inside the tabernacle space. And that's called the tent of meeting. And the tent of meeting was essentially two rooms. There's, look in verse... Uh, the, the, the last part of that passage, verse 33. The veil shall separate for you the holy place from the most holy. So the first place you would come into as the high priest would be the holy place. Behind the veil is the holy of holies, the most holy place. What separates them is the veil. Now I want to look at just a few things about this. First off, and I'm not pointing this out to try to sound brainy, but it's just one of those things that doesn't come through in English. The Hebrew word for veil is not the word that's used all through these other descriptions of the tabernacle for curtains. There, you know, the, the, the wall of the tabernacle are curtains. Uh, the roof of it in some ways was kind of like a curtain with other coverings. But the word that's used for veil is a different Hebrew word. If you look it up in sort of the standard academic Hebrew dictionary, uh, Brown Driver Briggs, it, de it defines the word as, quote, that which habitually shuts off. I mean, the job of this thing is not just to make uh, a vertical structure. It's not just to, to give a boundary. It is to separate you from what's on the other side of it. That's its function. It's a separator. And that's said explicitly in verse 33. 
Again, that last part of the verse. The veil shall separate for you the holy place from the most holy. What's in the most holy place? What's in the holy of holies? The Ark of the Covenant. The very presence of God. And it's this mystery where on the one hand God is what we call omnipresent. He is present everywhere. That's what Psalm 139 talks about. If I go here, if I go there, if I go up, if I go down, you're always there. God is everywhere. But in this unique, special way, He identifies with this box. And it's His idea, not ours. The very presence of God is in the Holy of Holies. What separates that space from the rest of the camp and the rest of the world is the veil. Its function is to separate. What did it look like? Look in verse 31. You shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns. That phrase is all through the description of the tabernacle. Uh, the, the, the other curtains in the space of the tabernacle had those colors. The, the priest's clothing, we're going to look at that tomorrow night, had those colors. You shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. But get this next part. It shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it. So in other words, if you saw this veil, blue, purple, scarlet, linen intertwined in it, but embroidered or worked into the veil were pictures of cherubim. What are cherubim? Angels. Okay, the cherubim are angels. They're different kinds of angels that the Bible names. We don't know a lot about them, but why is it significant that they are cherubim? When it says that you've got a separating object with cherubim in it, where should your mind go? To the end of Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve have sinned, and God's pronounced the curse, and they're sent out from the garden, and God posts who? Cherubim. And a flaming sword flashing back and forth, and it's to guard them from the tree of life. That veil... Besides being a physical barrier, it visually said, this is the ongoing effect of your rebellion. This is the ongoing aftermath that Adam and Eve ate that fruit. Now, with that in mind, I want you to think about this. Have you ever thought about, have you ever thought about how dangerous power cables are that we depend on? Like right now, it's snowing. In Greenville, South Carolina, we've been checking in to see if the power's still on. Sometimes Greenville gets bad ice storms. Everything's good so far. But you think about the fact that on the one hand, you're so glad we have power. But power cables are so incredibly dangerous. If a power cable comes down, you know, it'll like blow up a car. <laughs> or set grass on fire. Or, or, or kill somebody. But we're depending on that to like for our coffee makers to work. So, in other words, we've gotten accustomed to the, to the sight that there are these death cables over us <laughs> all the time. And we want the death cables to continue to be deadly so that we can make our coffee. But, like, how is it safe to make coffee when you have death cables? And that's where the power for the coffee makers comes from. Have we really thought through this before? <laughs> And, you know, the, now the more science crowd, the, the engineering crowd in here will know the reason we can do that is because of these things that when they blow up, it takes a, a year off our life, is a transformer. You know, if you look at the top of these power, power poles, up by the power lines, you'll see this, this kind of gray drum, and that's a transformer. What does a transformer do? It, uh, essentially, it just makes it where all this deadly power that's coming through can become manageable in your house and you can plug a coffee maker into it and not die. That's because of the transformer. Alright, let, let, me, let me throw out a weird thought. The incarnation of the Son of God is like a transformer. The second person of the Trinity is Yahweh. He is equal in power and glory to the Father. He's not less God than the Father. He's not less glorious. He's not less powerful. There's a mountain of scriptures to back that up. The Son of God is equal in power and glory to God the Father. And He was in our midst. And like people could touch Him and get better. 
You know, like the woman that had the, 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 the illness where she was bleeding and she couldn't get any relief, she couldn't get healing, and she snuck, snuck up behind him and touched him, and she got better just from touching him. And he turns and says, who touched me? I felt power go out from me. Whose power? Unfathomable power. Infinite power. And she was safe to do that. Why? Because of his flesh. Now here, here's, here's what I want you to think about. Listen to this text from Hebrews. This is Hebrews chapter 10. Beginning in verse 19, keep in mind, Hebrews talks a lot about the tabernacle and the priesthood and sacrifices. It's written for a Jewish audience. Listen to this. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, that's the image of going into the inner part of God's house, the inner part of God's tent, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that He opened for us through the curtain, that is, through His flesh. What does the curtain point ahead to? It's amazing. On the one hand, it's a visual depiction of the separation between God and man. On the other hand, it is a depiction of the incarnation that there is a way that a God who is holy, holy, holy can live in the midst of a camp of people who are consistently sinful. That veil is a picture of His flesh. It's funny, we actually sing that every Christmas. Hark the herald angels sing. I'm going to say three words. You tell me the three words that go before it. Blank, 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 the Godhead see. Veiled in flesh. Veiled in flesh. That's amazing. Uh, I, you know, sometimes the, the, uh, in the Reformed community, we're not comfortable with mystery, which means that we're not comfortable with like saying, here's a scripture and I don't know what it means. All right, I'm about to tell you a scripture and I'm going to tell you, I don't know what it means. I've never heard a sermon on it. I've never preached on it because I don't know what to do with it. But in John's account of when um, Judas, as he betrays Jesus, as he brings the guards to, to arrest Jesus and the signal, you know, they work out the signal. In John chapter 18, when he brings the guards to Jesus, <clears throat> Jesus asks them, whom do you seek? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And when you read it in an English translation, Jesus says, I am he. But in Greek, he says, I am. Now, what is, what's important about that phrase? That's the divine name. That's Yahweh. And that's a big deal in John, the I am sayings. But when they come, whom do you seek? Jesus of Nazareth, I am. John records that when he just says that, the guards draw back and they fall to the ground. He doesn't explain why, but the, just Scripture interpreting Scripture, what it seems to be a picture of is... When the second person of the Godhead, even though he's veiled in flesh, when he says the divine name, literally, it takes people to the ground. I don't know how else to explain that passage. People lived with Jesus and they ate with Jesus. They, he had siblings who grew up with him. A few hours after that, you can punch him. You can slap him. And you forget that he's Yahweh. He's the God that made the mountain tremble and basically become a volcano when He came down on Mount Sinai. He is that God. What veils all that power? His flesh. It's a picture of separation, but it's a picture of God's provision, how this God could come in our midst and coexist with us. Right. Let's keep going. The lampstand. It's chapter 25 of Exodus, beginning in verse 31. You shall make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be made of hammered work, its base, its stem, its cups, its calyxes, and its flowers shall be of one piece with it. And there shall be six branches going out of its sides, three branches of the lampstand out of one side of it, and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side of it. 
three cups made like almond blossoms, each with calyx and flower on one branch, and three cups made like almond blossoms, each with calyx and flower on the other branch. So for the six branches going out of the lampstand. And on the lampstand itself there shall be four cups made like almond blossoms with their calyxes and flowers, and a calyx of one piece with it under each pair of the six branches going out from the lampstand. Their calyxes and their branches shall be of one piece with it, the whole of it a single piece of hammered work of pure gold. You shall make seven lamps for it, and the lamps shall be set up so as to give light on the space in front of it. Its tongs and their trays shall be of pure gold. It shall be made with all these utensils out of a talent of pure gold, and see that you make them after the pattern for them which is being shown you on the mountain. And the first time I studied this passage, the burning question in my mind is, what the heck is a calyx? <laughs> I've never heard that word in my life. And uh, so here, just my little user-friendly definition is found around the base of a flower. It looks like a circle of small leaves. So be blessed by that information now. <laughs> a few things about the lampstand. First off, it's incredibly valuable. The lampstand and the, the equipment that went with it is made of a talent of pure gold. A talent is a unit of measurement. Best estimate is probably about 75 pounds. All right, as of this afternoon, the price of an ounce of gold was around $1,250 an ounce. $1,250 an ounce. If you multiply that times 16 to get a pound, and then you multiply that number times 75, you get $1.5 million. Uh, we don't know what height it was. We don't know the exact proportions of it, but just all that to say, it was incredibly valuable, this one item in the tabernacle. It's, it's the design from which the menorah comes. So you've got this base and you've got these, on both sides, these three branches that come from it so that you have seven lamps. Now, what was that saying? And I'll tell you right now, we don't know what all it was saying. Sevens are, are such, such a big deal in Scripture that you, could do, you, could go, you can kind of go crazy with it. Uh, I preached on Revelation about a year ago, and just uh, every time we came to sevens or twelves, I just felt like, ah, I don't know how. Let, let, me, let, me, let, let me just hit on a couple of things. Number one, to the Israelite, there were seven great lights. There was the sun, and there was the moon, and there were the five known planets. The seven great lights. In fact, the, the name in Genesis 1 of the lights that God put into the sky, that Hebrew word is the word that's used for the lights of the lampstand. So what is that a picture of? In, in some ways it's a picture of this God is so great that like the sun, the moon, and the planets, He keeps those in His house. That's how, you know, the transcendent God. This is the great creating God. This is the God that spoke these lights into existence. And it's in His house. So in some ways it's a picture of God the Creator. The light of creation. But I want you to think about this. And this may sound like stating the obvious, but I, I just, this did never clicked with me for the longest time. We're so used to being able to turn on lights when we're inside a space that we forget about how much of history wasn't that way. The only light inside the tent of meeting was this lampstand. Now again, not insulting your intelligence, but just that's really important. The only light inside the tent of meeting was the golden lampstand. Now why is that important? If you, if you were the high priest or you're one of the other priests that helped take care of the table with the bread on it, if you went into the holy place, you can be the priest who's supposed to be there. You can be there at the time of day that you're supposed to be there. You can be the high priest going in on the Day of Atonement, which was the only time you're supposed to go in there behind the veil. Uh, you can be where you're supposed to be, and you can be the guy that's supposed to be there, but you would see nothing especially if you did something at night. I mean, going into that space where no sunlight goes, it would be absolutely opaque if you didn't have the golden lampstand. God gave the light by which you saw everything else in His house. Now, kind of let that sentence sit with you. God provided the light by which you saw and understood 
what was in his house. Like you might know the veil is there, but you couldn't see the veil without the lampstand. You might know that the table of showbread is there, but you couldn't see it without the lampstand. You might know that the altar of incense, that you'd smell the altar of incense when you walked in, but you couldn't see it without the light. You saw it with the light that God provided. And man, think about that. Let's think about middle schoolers and high schoolers. Think about what all is vying for their attention about how they know what they know. In what philosophers call epistemology. How do you know what you know? Now your middle schoolers and high schoolers aren't going to be using that word, but they are studies in epistemology. How do they know what they know? For instance, uh, my, my, my children have gotten to where they will roll their eyes when they watch Disney movies or Pixar movies. It's kind of become a joke in our house because over and over and over and over when you get to some big climactic scene in the movie, the big takeaway point is believe in yourself. And it's over and over and over. Kung Fu Panda? When he finally got the scroll? It wasn't, it was the, 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 what was it called? The J, the, I haven't seen it in a while. The, the Dragon Scroll. Yes. Yes. As we pray. Opens the Dragon Scroll and, you know, and then what does the big takeaway end up being? You know, you see yourself, believe in yourself, like the great knowledge is that you believe in yourself. But man, uh, your middle schoolers, your high schoolers, they just grew up with that. And I'm not saying like, they didn't have those good godly cartoons that we did. I'm not saying that. <laughs> Back in my day, we watched Looney Tunes, you know, and we loved the Lord because of it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not arguing for better cartoons in an earlier time. I'm saying that's just, you know, like, since they could watch those movies, that was just that, that message was being reinforced over and over and over. How do middle schoolers know what they know about sex? Uh, how do high schoolers know what they know? about responsibility or work? How do high schoolers know what they know about femininity or beauty? How do middle schoolers know what they know about marriage or family dynamics? Because they're all the, I mean, I know I'm stating the obvious, there are all these things coming at them. Think about how beautiful it is to be able to say with people, look, God is giving us light by which I'm not saying there's no mystery I'm not saying that we'll always you know that we can understand everything but God is giving us light where you can start to look around you and understand what you're seeing that God is letting you see things as they really are what is the light he's giving us um man lots of passages I want to throw at you let me give you one think about the lampstand Light of creation, the seven lights, the light of revelation. The only way that you can see what God is doing, the only way you can see what's in His house is what He's provided. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 says this, For God who said, quote, Let light shine out of darkness. It's a creation phrase. For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I'm going to read that one more time. For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Man. Think about how the person and work of Christ is light, on the one hand, to understand how God is transcendent and imminent. Why is that man up there, naked and beaten and bloody and screaming, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God is transcendent. You want to know how much he hates sin? There you go. That's how much he hates sin. But think about how that is light into God's imminence. Why is that man up there instead of me? Why does God the Father send him to go there instead of me? Why does that man willingly go there instead of me? Because God is imminent. God is love. The light into understanding both those realities is the person and work of Christ. 
Think about this. Think about if you have a high schooler and uh, let's say she has a Muslim friend in her school and she's wrestling with, <clears throat> I don't know how we can say God is love if he would send someone like her to hell. And do you ever get those kinds of questions? They're tough. And uh, they're never easy and we don't want to give prepackaged answers, but I would say, when you don't know what to say, hide behind Jesus. Um, listen, if you love your Muslim friend, you should. Because you know what? Human beings are amazing. Human beings are the pinnacle of creation. And you know what? That is, that is exactly why God is so upset. That the pinnacle of His creation is the only part that rebels against Him. And listen, it's not just Muslims, it's not just Hindus, it's people who've grown up in the church. Anyone who wants to come to Him and not need His provision is doomed. Like, here's how great God is. God is so great that when He saw the plight of human beings, the only part of His creation that bears His image, He became one. And grew up as a poor one. And got beat up as one. And slapped as one. And tortured as one. And killed as one. He's that invested in saving the human beings. Is that going to make this 11th grader automatically feel better about hell? No? Maybe not? But what are you pushing her toward? If you're going to see this with the light that God, God provided, you've got to see it in the light of the gospel. You've got to see it through the light of Jesus Christ. But let me end with this. Um... The lampstand is the light where you see what's in God's house. We can see what's in God's house. Um, if you're on staff with a church or you work closely with a church, you see, no pun intended, you see behind the veil of churches. How has that affected you? Um, are you becoming more cynical? Are you becoming more distrustful of the Holy Catholic Church? Uh, the only way that you're going to be able to be absolutely honest with how messed up the church is and simultaneously be hopeful about what the church can be is if you have the light of Jesus Christ. Because that's the only thing that lets you simultaneously hang on to he loves the messed up people and came for the messed up people. The one not messed up person takes the punishment of the messed up people. That's his church. On the other, on the other hand, what he did is so powerful that it saves and redeems people like us. Uh, other staff, my pastor, these elders that frustrate me, these parents that frustrate me, these, these students that float in and out of our youth group and they go AWOL for no apparent reason. He came to redeem people just like that. Um, this is light for us not to become cynics and to hang on to joy. I'm going to pray that God would do that in our lives. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, you are very great and you are very near. We, we are in awe that the flesh of Jesus is uh, veiling the very Godhead, that all the fullness of deity is found in that man in flesh sitting at your right hand. Our Father, we pray that we would um, teach this rising generation that the light that we need to understand the world around us comes through the person and work of Jesus, but we pray that we would believe that too. 
uh, Lord Jesus, that the light of your face would shine into our hearts if we are very discouraged with the church, if we are angry at the youth that we work with, if we are hateful or angry at parents, if we are angry at our churches, that your light would shine into our hearts. And we ask this in your name. Amen.